since my deliverance by the French government from the talons of my five years imprisonment, I have taken great pleasure in speaking at length with my son, Georges, of Mount Vernon, of its revered inhabitants, and of the bond so sweetly felt between a father and his son and this man who has indeed become a father to us both. I think often to the time when I first met the General Washington. It was an age ago, yet so clearly do I remember it. The summer of 17 and 77, the city tavern in Philadelphia, the windows left open to relieve the room of an oppressive Philadelphia heat, and yet the air remained smoky in spite of this because of all of the lamps and the tapers lit over the course of the evening. I remember sitting at one end of a very long table, His Excellency at the other, and everyone was distracted by his presence. His figure, noble and kind, his smile, gentle, he inspired, rather than commanded respect. And there I was, but 19 years old, a thin youth in a fancy new uniform. I hesitate to think of what he must have thought of me at this time. But when the meal was concluded, he took me aside and spoke to me very kindly. He complimented me on the service and sacrifices that I had made in support of the American cause and, and told me it would please him if I called the quarters of the commander-in-chief my home and considered myself a part of his family. His family, this word, even now it strikes at me like a sort of bolt, family. Because you see, there is a very similar word in French, the word famille. But this word, it refers only to relatives of the blood, you see. I learned shortly thereafter that His Excellency was referring to his military family and to the officers under his command. But for a moment, I believed it was His Excellency's intention to adopt me as his son, for I knew he had none of his own, and for I had never known my own father. But alas, now His Excellency too is lost to us. The bond I now share with my son is one of mourning. It was of a sentiment of the utmost filial affection that led me to give his name to my only son. And my most sincere wishes will follow his name and whatever else shall remain to us of this most excellent man. But this loss is not confined to me, nor is it shared only by my family or by the military family into which I was so graciously welcomed by His Excellency those years ago. No, 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 this is a loss to the world. In Europe, you see, I still serve the cause and the friends of liberty. And I have been pierced by the General's teachings. I have labored at some difficulty to spread these teachings across the vast and stormy stages of the French Revolution. I wrote in my last letter to His Excellency that your opinion, mon cher général, remains to me as it has always been of a weight immense. And it is still his opinion which I shall keep foremost in my mind as I prepare to fight a new kind of tyranny presently on the rise here in Europe. In his last letter to me, I remember, His Excellency told me of how, even after his farewell address to the American people, still he felt compelled to take up the sword in the service and the defense of his countrymen. He told me he could not remain an indifferent spectator to their plight, and I fear that neither shall I remain an indifferent spectator to the plight of my fellow native countrymen in France. For the French have now grown all too accustomed and familiar with their rights to have forgotten them beyond our recall. <sighs> may I, I may be barred from attending the memorials to this man, the closest man that I have ever known to a father. I may be dispossessed of my wealth and of my title. My name may be excised from his eulogies, but I shall continue to fight for his principles, and his legacy shall live on through me, through my son. Adieu, mon cher général.